should be manageable based on what you've done in the past lectures, okay? All right, so I'm going to complete the problem from last time. These are the things that we derived last time. I'm just going to write them down here, okay? So this is uh, for a planar curve. Curvature kappa plus magnitude f double prime, and they divided by the same quantity to power three by two. One plus f prime squared to the power three by two. If I write one more thing here, will everybody be able to see? People in the back and on both sides as well. Just one last thing here, okay? From last time only. So s dot. Here is our problem. We complete this today and then move on to a different problem. Okay. Uh, so in this, uh, we have parabolic trajectories. down the position vector and all these things. I'm going to go to the details again. A couple of things I want to point out. So now I am in a position to start substituting for f of x, f prime of x, f double prime and so on. Okay? So let me take the spatial derivative, f prime With that, I'm going to start substituting for ET and EN, and uh, we will figure out using ET what is the angle between the I and the J component for the tangential unit vector. I think we spoke about it last time, but we'll go over those details now. So ET. Now I have by the denominator f prime squared is minus 2x whole squared, so that's 4x squared. Minus 2x 
So we immediately recognize that the tangential unit vector ET, of course its magnitude is 1, but it has a component in the i direction, the positive i direction, and it has a component in the negative j direction, okay, or in the vertical direction pointing down. So if I draw it out, so here is ET, at any point on this trajectory, okay, it's going to have a positive i component negative j component. The i component is 1 by 1 plus 4x squared to the power 1 by 2. And this guy, just the magnitude of it is 2x by whatever the quantity. This is for our curve. And if I call the angle between ET and the x-axis as theta, we immediately recognize that for what values of x, I'm going to call the values of x, I'm going to be having a negative slope, which is given by the fact that dy by dx is minus 2x. And that makes sense here. Okay. All right. And uh, I think uh, we call this a sine theta and cos theta as well. So for us, sine theta is going to be 2x by 1 plus 4x per Questions so far? With all this information, we are ready to solve the problem. We write the equation of motion and so on. We found the degree of freedom was x of t from last time, one degree of freedom. We have two constraints, three configuration coordinates, and uh, we drew the free body and the kinetic diagram as well last time. Okay? So here was the free body and the kinetic. diagram, mass times acceleration in a normal direction. Mass times acceleration in the tangential direction. And then the free body diagram. This is the same. FBD. The particle is contacting the parabolic wire, so there is a normal force. We assume that the path is smooth and frictionless, which means that there is going to be only gravity as the additional force here in the vertical direction. Mg. And if I draw a tangent to the particle at that point in time, Okay, so here is the tangent to the particle at that point in time. I immediately recognize that angle as the angle theta that we just worked with. So this angle is theta. And so I can split the force mg into components along the normal and the tangential directions. Okay, so there's going to be one component this way. And the other. Can be split out mg from and 
that bit of theta okay, by geometry. And so I'm going to have mg cos theta and mg sin. Questions? Tangential normal components of acceleration, we looked at them last time. So A T is S double dot, which is the rate of change of the velocity, or the rate of change of speed in the tangential direction. Then A N is kappa S dot square. S dot is the speed of the particle. Right, so we have everything ready to write the equation of motion. The degree of freedom is x or theta, so we just uh, make a note of that. x of t, but we have a relationship between x of t and s dot, or x dot and s dot somewhere down here, so we can make use of all of those things as we get to the equation of motion. So two equations for me. One is sum of forces in the normal direction, sum of forces in the tangential direction. The tangential direction, this is forces in the kinetic diagram in the positive tangential direction. So whatever it is at that instant in time, I'm just summing forces along with it. In the kinetic diagram, it's fairly trivial. That's just mass times acceleration. So mass times S double dot, which is the acceleration in the tangential direction. Then I have the forces, which is mg sine theta. And that's about it. So this is the equation one. This is the equation of motion. As simple as that. But we don't have it in the degree of freedom yet. All we need to do is one more round of differentiation, and we should be able to get it. Second equation in the normal direction, we need that too. Get rid of this panel here for uh, everybody. Okay. So let us first look at equation one. 
which means I need my S double dot in terms of the degree of freedom. So I'm going to use my relationship here. Okay, so I have S dot. Dot. f prime squared to the power 1 by 2. I'm going to substitute for f prime, which is minus 2x. So f dot is x dot 1 plus 4x square to the power 1. differentiate on both sides with respect to time. I'm going to get S double dot on one side and then I have to use the product rule because I have two terms. S double dot. Differentiation of the first term which is X dot which is just going to be X double dot with respect to time. X double dot 1 plus 4X square to the power 1 by 2. Keep x dot as it is and differentiate the rest of the terms. So this is going to be x dot, differentiation of a square root term. I'm going to have a factor of a half. And then 1 plus 4x squared to the power 1 by 2 minus 1. And then differentiation of the 4x squared term with respect to time. So I have to use the chain rule there. And that's going to be 8x x dot. My question to all of you is, are we comfortable doing stuff like this? Or do you want me to go through these steps here? Uh, I'm more than happy to do it, if you'd like me to. Maybe at the end of class or something, we can go over these things, okay, if you have questions. Cancel of a factor of a half, this one goes. Now 4 x dot x dot combines becomes x dot square, so I have s double dot. It's a fairly non-trivial expression as you can see. This is x double dot. 1 plus 4 x square to the power 1 by 2 plus 4 x x dot square. And all I need to do to write the equation of motion is take this big guy and then substitute that to the equation of one. That's about it. It's another matter of solving this thing because it is a nonlinear ordinary differential equation. We're going to talk about that, uh, how to use MATLAB to simulate some of these problems and so on. Just bear with me while we finish off a couple of uh, problems, get us used to these transformations and so on. Okay? I just substitute this into equation one. Cancel of the mass on both sides doesn't make a difference to us. So no matter the size of the particle, you see that, if there is no effect of friction, then it's not going to play any role in the equation of motion. Not so much for uh, the velocities and so on. We're going to see that in a second. Okay? So the equation of motion. So S double dot E sine theta. Instead of sine theta, I think I should have... Uh, kept my stuff, but some of you may have written it out earlier, so sin theta was 2x by 1 plus 4x square, sin theta was 1 by that term, the substitute, so 2xg plus 4x squared to the power 1 by 2 is equal to all of those guys, x double dot and so on. So this is x double dot, 1 by 2, and 4x x dot square.
can simplify that by taking the term of the denominator here and then multiplying it through. And I'll just rearrange the equation so that we write it in the typical form, which is x double dot. Terms containing the highest derivatives typically will be on the left hand side. All the other terms will be on the right hand side. Okay, so this is going to be 1 by 1 plus 4 x square 2 gx minus 4 x x up. This is the equation. So, our next order of business is to come up with a criterion for the initial velocity so that there is no incipient separation. That is, I have an initial displacement, I have an initial velocity. For what value of the particular initial velocity will the bead instantaneously separate from the trajectory as long as, as soon as I give that value of velocity? Or what is the threshold for which you know, I have to stay below? so that I have some motion at least occurring. At some point, it's going to lose contact, that's for sure. Depending on what the normal force is doing and depending on the roughness of the surface and so on. But I don't want it to lose contact the minute I set it on the wire and then let it go. So we want to find out that condition. Okay, so what is value of S dot naught, which is the initial velocity, so that incipient separation does not happen. Conversely, what is the value of V naught for which incipient separation occurs? The same, same thing. This one is the opposite of the other. I'm going to save this equation somewhere safe. Have, uh, I'm just rearranging it, taking the normal force, bringing it on one side. So n is mg times theta minus m kappa s dot square. Okay, this is the equation we just derived. I'm just rewriting it so that the normal force is on one side and everything else is on the other side. I'm going to get rid of that. There is no hard and fast rule that you have to use the Trenet area frame to solve this problem. You can use any kind of a coordinate frame. Okay, you can use, even the Cartesian system, it is just going to be a lot more complicated. Yeah, quick question. Uh, that should just be a cosine theta. So oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we have come to the condition for separation. I'm going to draw the trajectory of the, of the hyperbolic wire. And the normal force between the bead and the wire is pointing in the negative normal direction. So I'm going to write it as a normal vector. Okay. My positive normal direction is this way. positive tangential direction is this way. If I write the normal force, minus n times okay. What do you think is the condition for separation? Tangent to zero. N is zero, it is the starting point. 
But if I want to have a more broader category of uh, criteria, yes. So would it be when n exceeds the uh, the portion of the, the gravity that's in the direction of the normal force? That is uh, figuratively what we are trying to find out absolutely right. Uh, but I'm trying to write it as an equation, yes. It's non-positive. It's non-positive if I take its uh, dot product with the normal one. If it is non-positive or if it is negative, then there is no separation. If n is negative, there is no separation. If n is positive, there is separation. So if I say condition for separation, when the dot product of this is greater than or equal to zero. Does this make sense to everybody? My normal force is negative. If the normal force becomes positive, which means that the normal force direction has flipped, so it means that the bead has separated from the fat, but the normal force is trying to pull it back. Physically speaking, there is no normal force anymore. But as long as I reach this condition, then I'm pretty much good to go. So this is the condition for separation. Okay? And so we are now going to look at the value of the normal force. So from before. Look at the value of the normal force. So this is mg cosine theta, which is mg by 1 plus 4 x square to the power 1 by 2, okay. minus uh, the curvature. We can calculate that. So that's uh, 2 times m times x dot square. Magnitude of f double prime was 2. Divided by 1 plus 4 x square to the power 3 by 2. This is the normal for the expression that we have from our equation. From force terms. interested in incipient separation, which means that I am interested in what's happening at time t is equal to 0, right after I give an initial displacement. Okay, so let's say initial displacement. Is x naught. Let's say that this is a value that we know. It could be 0 or it could be non-zero. So we are given We need to find out what is V naught. For no separation. Or what is V naught for separation? Okay, if you want, you can rewrite it that way also. So let me, because since I already have equation for separation, what is V naught for separation of the bead from the surface? So I write. L naught. Okay, so this is now going to be my expression for that. I'm going to have mg times all of those terms, or uh, maybe we will save it for for some time. Uh, we'll just uh, hang on to what we have so far. What I want to do now is I want to relate v naught to the initial displacement and so on, so that I can do all these substitutions into my normal force equation. In this problem, there is no friction, which means that this is a conservative system. Energy is conserved. So which means if I look at the sum of the kinetic and the potential energies at time p naught, which is based on x naught and v naught, it should be equal to the sum at some other random time t. Okay? Conservative system, no friction. So, sum of kinetic and potential energies at P naught should be equal to. 
kind of take important telemetry of some kind, see. To calculate potential energy, here is what I do. I draw my figure once more. Okay. One should make sure that you are not double counting for the potential energy because you set up a datum. Okay, so here is my datum. I'm looking at the bead at two different instances in time. One is at time t naught, sitting somewhere here. At time t, at time t naught, at both instances my potential energy is negative. Okay, so here is the height y naught, which is at time t naught. Then the location or the distance from the datum at time t is some height y. These are now magnitudes. Okay, so I'm just writing them as a magnitude. This is also written as a magnitude because I'm saying that we are sitting below the datum. If you're sitting below the datum, the potential energy terms are negative. Above the datum, potential energy terms are positive. You know this from you know dynamics. Half m v naught square, basic kinetic energy. Potential energy minus mg. Magnitude of y naught, magnitude of y naught, this is equal to half m s dot square, which is your uh, velocity at some time t, or v square if you want to call it that way, minus mg times magnitude of y. Why I'm calling this as a magnitude is because for us the trajectory is y is equal to minus x squared. So if you do the substitution directly without taking the magnitude and say this is minus x squared or minus x naught squared, this becomes positive, that's not correct because I'm sitting below the data. Okay? So continue in four. Right, so from here I have half and as well, well, I can cancel the mass off if you right? So that's one thing I can do. So m s s dot square by two. Or divide everything by two, so I have s dot square is s dot square. Bring terms onto the right hand side, so this becomes g times magnitude of y. Magnitude of y naught. A factor of two. Makes sense to everybody? Yes, it's right. Should this be v naught squared? Oh, yes, v naught squared. Thank you. I should have left it as s naught squared. It should be more consistent. I should have called everything as s naught and bring it to that. S dot naught squared. All right. Now I substitute for y as x squared and all, all that. So S dot square is v naught square two g x square minus x naught square. Please notice I have taken the magnitude and we have substituted y is equal to magnitude of minus x squared. Next is I'm going to take all of these guys, substitute them into this guy, and magically things will start making sense. Okay. So let's see what happens. So I have s dot square in terms of the initial uh, conditions and so on, and also in terms of uh, the distance x square. My hope is if I do the substitutions in there the x square terms will cancel off, so that I will have a normal force only in terms of the initial variables of the problem, which is s naught and uh, v naught, or x naught and v naught. Okay? 
Okay, so let's do that. So N is Mg one plus four x square to the power one by two minus two M one plus four x square to the power three by two times linear square two G Is it okay if I erase this this board here? Everybody got it? This one here. Okay. Now I want to look at the condition for separation. So I take the dot product of the normal vector with the Unit uh, uh, normal force vector with the unit normal. Okay, so now I have force separation. We have n dotted with n greater than or equal to zero, where the normal vector is minus n times e n. So this essentially implies that minus n e n dot the E n is greater than or equal to zero or n is less than or equal to six. And the E n dot E n is one. Minus of n greater than or equal to zero is the same as flipping the inequality and saying n less than or equal to zero. This is all assuming that the direction of n is in the negative normal direction. Then I take this big guy here and then substitute it into this inequality. And if, if this all makes, uh, if this all is confusing, you can just say that when n is equal to zero is when the separation first stuck. That is also equally fun. Okay? I just want to come up with a more general class of solutions. So I'm going to take whatever we have, then say that so mg one plus four x square minus 2m by whatever to the power 3 by 2 v naught square 2g less than or equal to 0. Okay, all I did was substitute for the normal force which we had obtained it in that channel there. Cancel of the mass it does not do anything for us. I'm going to take a common denominator, which is this bigger of the two terms, 1 plus 4 x squared to the power 3 by 2 is my denominator. So if I do that, I'm going to come here. Three by two. I'm multiplying all through by one plus four x squared to the power three by two. So I have a three by two. I have a one by two. So that's going to be one plus four x squared. And z times one plus four x squared. Two times v naught plus two g x squared x naught squared. I want it in terms of all the initial variables of the problem, and you see something very nice is going to happen now. If I take these terms and then spread uh, the factor of 2 inside, this is g, 4g x squared, just multiplying 2 by g, minus 2v naught, minus 2v naught, 
minus 2 times 2 4 g times x square minus 4 g x square plus 4 g x naught square less than or equal to 0. And understand this is the criterion for separation that we are looking at. Okay? This is gone. It so happens to be the case because it's a conservative system. Yes, sir. Are you missing a square on V naught? I believe that, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. It so happens to be the case because it's a conservative system. If friction were playing a role, we would not have such nice things happening. You can still come up with the criterion for separation, but it's not going to look as good. Okay, friction is always a nasty player, which you're going to see in the next problem. Right? So now if I rewrite everything, bring this 2 v naught square to the other side, so I'm going to have 2 v naught square, I'm flipping the inequality because I'm just rewriting everything, flip around. So 2 v naught square is v times 1 plus 4 x naught square. So if v naught is greater than the following value, square root of g times square 2 for separation. And I should say for incipient separation, that is the moment I place the bead on the wire and I give it a velocity that is greater than this particular value, it's going to instantaneously separate from the wire. So I should say incipient separation. And if I don't have initial displacement, you just substitute x naught is equal to 0. If v naught is greater than or equal to square root of g by 2, numerically, then I'm going to have such as long as soon as I put the b on the one. And why is this useful is because when you start simulating things in MATLAB, you need to come up with a family of initial conditions, which makes sense. Right? So rather than guessing an initial condition and saying, okay, hey, at this initial condition, maybe this is not going to fall off, this is a better way of doing it. Given a certain initial displacement, which could be zero for all that you want, this is the condition for initial, initial separation or incipient separation. And that's the end of this particular problem. And this is the same route that you will take for your homework problem, which is uh, for a bead on a cubic pack. It's not any different from what we are doing here. We're going to do exactly a carbon copy of this. And as we get into you know, more deeper homeworks, you'll see that these ideas will play with themselves more, more often. I want to pause here for questions. Yes. Um, way back when we got our ET term, uh, that vector, we had a positive i hat value. Does that mean that the motion is from left to right? Right. It's sliding down the line. Right. Along the path. Tangent to the Absolutely. And if you had flipped it, if, you had stu if, you, if your uh, x is negative, then it would be pointing down. So we'll go to a new problem now. I'm going to erase all of these and uh, some of that. So I want to do two more problems before we start going into rigid body kinetics and so on, uh, three-dimensional rigid body kinetics and so on. Uh, this first problem that I'm going to solve will be a bead on a conical surface. The conical surface is rotating. Now we will start bringing our good friend friction into play and see how much more nastier the equations can get. Okay? And then the other problem that I want to solve is the problem of Foucault's pendulum, uh, which perhaps if you're going to cosine, you may have seen that, and it's a proof that the Earth rotates. So we will prove that the Earth rotates. Some people don't believe it to be the case. So we will try to prove it mathematically.
conical surface, right? So let's set up. Uh, Curfews and curfews, right? So this is x i, x y, and z. Unit vector i hat, j hat, and k hat. So this is my x y plane. Just drawing it out. Now I'm going to consider a rotating cone. such that its apex is fixed at this particular point. Let's call that at point O. And the cone is spinning at a constant rate of omega about the z axis. I hate to say concentrate because it's not like we are restricting ourselves to that case. We can do it for a general case as well. Okay, so the cone is rotating. at the rate of omega. So let's just say at the rate of omega. The cone rotates. And the rate omega about the k hat. We are not interested in the cone, okay? We have not got to the deeper dynamics. I'm going to now say that there is a particle with a spring attached at the point O. Here is the particle, and this is a particle on the inner surface of the cone. Okay, the particle B. Of mass L. On the inner surface, and now you see how this criterion for separation and all that comes into play, right? So there is a portion of time where the particle will be spinning inside the surface of the cone. We are assuming that the cone is rough on the inside. But we can come up with a criterion for separation that says that, okay, if the initial velocity is large enough or it goes beyond a certain value, this particle will lose contact with the inner surface and it will just become a springy pendulum. It will become a spherical pendulum, actually, with a spring, which is much more uh, you know, complicated than a normal spherical pendulum. Okay? And let's say that the uh, coefficient of uh, static and kinetic friction are mu s and mu k on the inside. So This is on the inner surface. We are all looking at the inner surface. This is the spring of stiffness k. Stiffness k and uh, unstretched length L0. that this particle were attached to this point O by a string of fixed length, or if you can think of it as a very thin, rigid bar of fixed length, then that becomes a constraint on the particle. If I have a spring, it is not a constraint, because if you are using a spring, we are operating under the assumption that the spring behaves as a linear element, and so it allows me to flex as much as I want within constraints of linearity. So that's not necessarily a constraint. So having a spring in our situation is not a constraint. Physically speaking, of course, you can have constraints on springs. You cannot take a spring beyond a certain point where it becomes classically deformed. Okay, so you're going through some bending stresses. You can come up with a criterion that says, okay, this is the maximum I can stretch this particular spring. We are not going to do things like that. You might have come across that in machine elements and so on. But we are not going to do that. For us, this is a linear spring. We are operating under the assumption that the 
stretch of the spring does not break the principles of linearity. Okay? So this is no longer a constraint for us. So springs are not constraints for us. problem we need to obtain the equation of motion, the equations of motion. Okay. Okay. Equations of motion and this is uh, quite a long journey as you will see. So what are our assumptions? We are not saying that motion is restricted to a planar situation, which is complete three-dimensional motion. Okay? We don't assume any smooth surface or anything inside. Friction is going to play a role. The only assumption that we have is the spring we are operating is which is a linear spring, so it does not impose a constraint on the problem. But there is a constraint on the problem, and I'm going to show that here. As long as the bead is in contact with the inner surface of the cone, the bead is constrained by the angle of the cone, the slant angle of the cone. Okay? So this is a fixed cone. Right? So it's going to have an angle which I'm going to call, uh, I guess if I draw, if I draw a line like that, I can call that as the cone angle alpha. So alpha is the cone angle, this is a fixed quantity, okay, it's a configuration of the geometry of the cone, it's a part of the geometry of the cone, so this is fixed. All right. And for today's lecture, you know, my plan is we will set up the kinematics of the problem, we will look at what are the configuration coordinates, what are the constraints, how many degrees of freedom we have, and then in the next class we'll look at the uh, force patterns. We will see, okay, at what point is static friction going to hold true? What is the constraint for that? Static friction is an inequality. Once we break static friction, then we enter the, uh, enter the realm of kinetic friction. What happens when we enter there? What is the magnitude of the friction force? All right. So first things first, what you can think of in this problem, and there are multiple ways of dealing with this problem, you can use a Fresnel array frame, completely fine. I'm not going to do that because we will eventually end up looking at a Fresnel array frame, but it is difficult to understand the rotations of the frame to begin with. Okay? So for this problem, I'm going to use a cylindrical polar coordinate. It is essentially thinking as if this bead is within a cylindrical surface. But the cylindrical surface is constrained by the angle of the cone. You can also use a spherical coordinate frame, which we will be doing in the next problem, which is a four coordinate. So this means that all along the way, you have seen all the coordinate frames that we will use for any kind of a dynamics problem: Cartesian, the Fresnel array, which you just saw, the cylindrical polar, spherical polar. Okay. So for this, I'm going to use a cylindrical polar setup. Cartesian, first of all. This is the point O. I'm going to attach a frame that is rotating with the cone, first of all. So this is uh, now the X, Y, Z coordinate frame. So this is I hat. A hat, A hat, so I'm going to call that as frame F1. Okay, so frame F1, I hat, A hat, A hat, fixed. I'm going to attach a frame to the cone, and if the cone is spinning, the frame is going to rotate to the cone. This is exactly like what we saw for a previous cone problem we saw. I'm attaching a frame to the instantaneous uh, line of contact. There's no instantaneous line of contact here. Okay. 
but I can attach a frame. I'm going to call that as the default, right? Okay, so here is another frame that is rotating along with the cone. I'm going to call it the Z1, E2, and E3. This is Z1, which is unifactor E2. Unifactor E3, which is coincident with the K hat direction. So frame R2 is E1. E2 and E3, which is attached to the cone body. This rotates with the cone with respect to a fixed frame. So I'm going to call this as F2. Frame F2. Now I have the following choice. From where the particle is sitting, I'm going to drop a projection onto the E1, E2 plane. Okay, so I'm going to drop a perpendicular line in it. So okay, so this is the projection onto the E1, E2 plane. Join that with the point O. This is 90 degrees. So if I draw a line parallel to that along here, it's probably going to be somewhere right here. That is also 90 degrees. So you see that there is a plane that I have drawn. Maybe darker colors. All right, so here is a plane that I have drawn. So this is point O, this is point P. And I'm dropping this onto the E1, E2 plane. I can as well drop this with respect to the IJ plane. It's pretty much the same, but the only thing is that the even E2 plane itself is rotating. It is processing about the vertical direction. Okay? So which means if I set up a polar coordinate frame with respect to the even E2 frame, I can say that this is an angle, I'm going to call this as the angle, let's say, phi. So I'm setting up a polar coordinate frame, angle phi, then this is distance r and the height from the e1, e2 plane all the way to where the particle p is, is the height z. Does my figure make sense to it? Does this make sense to it? Then I'm going to set up unit vectors. Okay? So unit vectors, these are all now with respect to the E1, E2, E3 frame, mind you. They are not with respect to the IJK frame. I have the option of doing that also. It is not wrong. But I'm doing it with respect to the E1, E2 frame. And I'm going to have a unit vector from the point O. Let me call this as point B. Right there. So there's a unit vector in the radial direction. I'm going to call it as ER. Then I'm going to have a unit vector that is on the plane E1, E2, perpendicular to ER, and it's in the direction of increasing phi, so that's E5. So this is point B. And uh, this is E5, so ER and E5 are on the E1, E2. E and E5 are perpendicular to each other. E5 in the direction of increasing. Phi. E R is perpendicular to E5. Does my figure make sense to everybody? angle inside here is the angle 
Okay, it is the angle made by the line OP with respect to the fixed point O. Okay, this is the cone angle, this is the fixed angle. And uh, this is now my frame, let's call it as frame F3. F3 is going to have three unit vectors, two of which are seen here. This is ER and E5. The third one is going to be the cross product of ER and E5, and you can see that this is obviously going to be perpendicular to the even E2 plane, and so this is going to be in the E3 direction. Okay, so this is now going to be E3, where is E R cross E5, which is the same as K. So I want to see if there are any questions or uh, points of clarification that I can afford to give you here at this stage. Yes. What's gamma? Uh, where is gamma? Oh, this is R, I'm sorry. Uh, this is R, yeah, sorry. This is R, huh? So this is distance from point four to point three. From point four to point three is R in the E R direction. Okay, and from point uh, B to point P, Z in the E three direction. I'm going to get rid of all of these things here. Once again, you are not limited by a coordinate system. Okay, it is you are uh, you can imagine solving this problem in any coordinate system you choose. Coordinate systems are for your con convenience. Certain problems are more easily solved in certain types of coordinates than other problems. And the biggest battle in dynamics is to figure out which coordinate frame should I start solving this problem. And many times, you know, that happens. Uh, the solution to that is obviously more practice, looking at more types of problems, and also having uh, a sense of the innate symmetry of the body. So in this problem, both cylindrical polar and spherical polar are equally an obvious choice, because of the fact that you can think of this bead as spinning inside some kind of a cylindrical surface or a spherical surface. Completely fine. You can choose both, or one or the other. You can know how to that. Okay, now let's write down uh, the uh, angular velocities of the frames. Omega of F2 slash F1, this is quite obvious. This is going to be capital omega in the k direction that's given to you. This is omega in the k hat direction, or omega in the e3 direction, same thing. Because of the fact that I'm defining here E theta and E5 with respect to E1 and E2, I have to write the angular velocity of F3 relative to F2, not F3 relative to F1. Okay? So omega F3 relative to F2. Can somebody help me with this? Uh, what do you think this is? And uh, just, just to help us out, uh, we have a polar, cylindrical polar coordinate system, so R, Z, and phi. Imagine this coordinate frame ER, E phi, and EZ. EZ is perpendicular to that, so that's pointing. Or E3 is perpendicular to that. That's pointing this way. So how will this coordinate frame rotate with the particle? phi dot in which direction? It's going to be only in the E3 direction. It does not have a capability to rotate anywhere else. 
as they seem clear to everybody. If I'm looking at the angular velocity of this frame, it is related to the frame F2, which means I fix F2. The cone is not rotating anymore. I'm just taking the bead and seeing it swim around the top of the cone or the bottom of the cone. All it's going to do is it's going to change only the variable phi, and that's going to be happening in the e3 direction. That's the direction of increasing phi. Okay. So omega of f3 slash f2 is phi dot e3, which is phi dot k. So that omega of f3 relative to f1, you can use your angular velocity addition. Now you see, I could have chosen a spherical coordinate. What would the variables in that frame be? Okay, one would be the distance from point O to the point P. The other would be, so if I draw a spherical coordinate, specifically, maybe I should draw both cylindrical and spherical. Okay, so if I choose a spherical coordinate frame, then my positions from O to P will be some kind of a length L along the point, uh, along the line OP. Then I'm going to have an angle theta, which is typically called your, uh, 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 some, some people call it the spin angle versus the azimuthal angle or the polar angle, many different ways of saying it. I will just call it as theta, simple enough. And then the third one will be the angle of phi. This will be your spherical polar coordinates. And if you look at the rotation of this coordinate system, because of the fact that this angle theta is the same as the angle alpha for us, that theta will not change. So theta dot is 0 which means the only variable that can change, which can cause any kind of a rotation, is the angle phi. And so there is not much of a difference between choosing a spherical versus a cylindrical. If I choose a cylindrical, this is the situation. This is r. This is phi. This is z. So r, phi, and z. Cylindrical. Spherical polar is L theta. So both of them are perfectly valid. You are only limited by your imagination in choosing one versus the other. Okay. So that's kind of makes the point. And in some ways, you can also think of it this way. It's kind of silly to think of it this way, but it helps me uh, to think of it. A cone is closer to a cylinder than to a sphere, right, in some sense. So it makes more sense to choose a cylindrical coordinate frame and go with it rather than a spherical cone, even though you're going to get the same answers, whether you choose one or the other. All right. Any questions, please? Everybody good with this figure here? We're now going to start writing the position address differentiated. A lot of mundane work, but you do it once, you're pretty much done with uh, this problem. Okay. So position vector. What is my plan? My plan is to obtain the acceleration of the point P, or the particle P, with respect to an inertial frame. So I first start off with the position vector. We don't use any kind of formulae except for one or two. But we derive them, so we have every right to use it. Okay. So R P slash O. Back to a problem. Look at this. I'm going to branch off and write it as two things. It's R B slash O plus R P slash B. Better addition. Okay. This is R B slash O plus R P slash B. Okay. 
dash O. Please come here. Now this is R in the ER. V in the E3 direction. Yes, this is my position vector. And I believe I skipped one thing. Uh, configuration coordinates and constraints and so on. So let me write it out here before we proceed further. Can I erase this panel? Okay. Configuration coordinates. Three of them are Y and Z. What are the constraints? Constraints are the angle alpha, the cone angle is fixed. So the number of degrees of freedom is 2. Before going further, let me just draw only a quick figure here. This is Z, O, B, this is R. This angle here is alpha. So this is a parallelogram, so this is also R. And this distance is also Z. And you can immediately see that I can relate R and Z. Right? R divided by Z is tan alpha. So I have two degrees of freedom. So what would be my degrees of freedom? What variables could I choose? among my subset of configuration coordinates. Yes. How do I say R and Z? Because they're going to be changing as your B moves along this frame. No, but, but I need two. For because, so because of the fact that R and Z are related to one another, I, could, I need to choose only one or the other. Oh. Right. So it could be R, and it could be the other variable, which is phi, because phi is changing. So phi dot could be changing, phi double dot could be non-zero. So I'm going to have two degrees of freedom, either R and Z, R, R or Z, one, and the other is phi, okay? So I can choose R or phi, or Z or phi as my degrees of freedom. Okay, so these are all right-angled triangles, and phi we were able to 